Um, and here are some, just some details about what I was talking about. So we were talking about waste garden material, um, cardboard, paper, broken down by these organisms in the soil. So they do the work for us. We have to give them the food, as it were, to make the compost. And of course we can use, it's a way of reusing things that we would normally throw away or put in our council recycling um, bins. So we can use them ourselves. We can use them for growing crops and plants um, and it's free, which is what's so wonderful. So what do we put it in? How do we start? We need to get hold of some sort of bin. It is possible to make a compost heap, which you may have heard of. If you've got a lot of space wherever you are, you can literally pile up this material in a pile, in a heap, on a bit of bare ground. But most of us are limited and we want to contain the materials that we're using. So there's loads of choice of what you're, you can get hold of. You can get hold of, you've probably seen them, different sorts of plastic containers um, that you can buy. And I've quoted some prices there. Probably the cheapest ones are about £35 um, for plastic ones. You can get very well insulated. They're called hot composters, which are more expensive. They're about 150 you can buy wooden ones that are ready to make and slot together, and they cost about 55 pounds. Or you can build them, and I'm going to talk about how to build one for ourselves. Or you can go onto sites like Freecycle and try and find a free one. I'm sure you'd find lots of people who have used theirs and don't need it anymore. So if you're making your own, you can make it from wooden pallets. Um, what you need is four, and you can see a picture there of the three sides. So they're on end and they're being fixed together in the corners. Uh, one way of doing that is to have wooden stakes which you push into the ground and you fix that through the, the pallets and that sort of holds it down. But other people might wire them together or you can put little corner brackets on. There are lots of different ways. You need some fine chicken wire to go around because you've got quite big gaps between the wood. So to hold the materials in, you might need wire or you can put wire at the bottom to stop rats and rodents getting in. Um, you need a sledgehammer to bang those posts in and a bow saw if you need to cut the top. If you look at the um, person in red, you can see a stake sticking up. You might want to cut it off to fit or it's fine. The good thing about making them yourself is that they, you get a nice big compost heap you can uh, container. So it could be one meter square, which is a good standard size. But if you don't want to do that, don't despair. The plastic ones are fantastic. They hold in the moisture and they work quite well. So there's details there on how to um, get hold of more details about how to build one. Gardener's World um, do it, and sorry, just whizzing on. Um, and they're very useful with all the details of it. So I've only sketched it through quite now. Um, so where do you put the bin once you've decided what you've got and you've got it? You need to put it somewhere that you can easily, all year round, add the ingredients from the kitchen or from the garden. Um, so perhaps near a path, near the back door to your property, somewhere where you can get to it. If you can, it's best to put it on bare soil or grass because you'll get any of the beneficial worms or organisms in the soil will naturally enter into the bottom of your bin to help break down those ingredients that you've got there. If you can't, it doesn't matter because you can add soil from the garden, which has some of those microorganisms or organisms in them. So you can introduce them like that. Um, if you're concerned about, I know people talk about it, getting rats or mice or something into your compost bin, put underneath chicken wire across the bottom, fine chicken wire, so it doesn't have too many big holes in it. And that should stop, hopefully stop any of those creatures getting in that you don't want to enter it. Um, the bins should be put somewhere sheltered. Um, for a compost bin to work, it has to be fairly warm, if not hot, if you can possibly get it. So you want to keep it away from where it might be exposed to cold winds or a frost pocket, which occurs often down a slope at the bottom of the slope. You'll know where you get frost in your garden more than anywhere else. Um, so if you can put it somewhere sheltered and 
slightly shaded, perhaps um, below some trees. Sorry, just move, trying to move that. Um, so that it's shaded also from direct sun because that can get too hot and too dry. So a nice sheltered spot, somewhere you can access in the garden and stop rodents getting in. So what do we put in? Let's get down to some nitty gritty. Um, we need to add what we call green material or fresh material, if you like. So these materials are wetter, moist, damp, and they've got lots of nitrogen and nitrogen we need for green growth in our plants. So they include kitchen waste. So as I said before, any raw vegetables, chopped up peelings, uh, fruit waste as well, if you're cutting up or you've got perhaps apples that have gone over or pears that have gone over, that's fine, they can go in. But what we absolutely don't want is cooked food, meat of any sort, anything with oil. So if you say cook potatoes and you think, well, they're vegetables, but they've got butter on or oil on, don't put them in, or dairy products. And these are things we don't put in, not because they won't break down, but because it will attract vermin and we want to avoid that. So we want to keep it to nice, raw vegetables or fruit. <clears throat> also, we want to include garden waste because we obviously have quite a lot of that, I imagine. So what should we put from the garden waste? And waste, I mean, stuff that you produce by tidying up your garden, deadheading uh, plants. So grass clippings are great if you've uh, got a lawn. Annual weeds. So in other words, the weeds that pop up very quickly have very light little roots, not long tap roots. Those are annual weeds. Um, they can go in, they'll break down, but not if they're flowering or gone to seed because the seeds might stay in the compost and then we're just getting more weeds in the garden. Um, if you've got things like dandelions, which are perennial weeds, if you, you know they've got a long tap root, you can actually cut off the top of those and use the green bit from the top, but don't put the root in because it might continue to grow dandelions or any other perennial weeds. If you've got prunings from shrubs, but thin prunings, light prunings, or really any other plant material, sometimes in the autumn you're cutting things back, you've got lots of waste. So any of that's fine, but don't put in anything that's diseased because it may not break down in the compost bin. So black spots, which you may have seen on roses, or rot on anything, that can go into the council um, composting or be burnt rather than enter into your compost and not get broken down and stay still some sort of disease. So nice, healthy garden waste as well. So what are the brown materials we, I was talking about earlier? These are drier and they contain carbon. They're made of carbon and that helps in the mixture of the compost that you're going to end up having. And these rich, carbon rich materials allow air circulation in the compost, which is very necessary. So dry and twiggy wooden, woody garden waste or dead leaves, eggshells, which you should crunch up, brown cardboard, as I said, you probably get a lot of it delivered, or plain paper or newspaper. And you can add pet bedding from vegetarian animals, so hamsters or rabbits, but not pet bedding from cats or dogs who eat meat. Those definitely can't go in. Um, but any of the above, um, if your brown cardboard has labels on or sellotape, you have to remove it because it won't break down. Or shiny magazines, all the sort of paper you get at Christmas, which has got glitter on it, that can't go in either. So we're talking about really plain paper. And this is really important because actually this is going to be the majority of what goes into our compost bin, surprisingly enough. So what else do we need to add to it? 
So we've said that microorganisms are the uh, little tiny organisms in the soil that we can't see, which are going to break down all those materials that you've just put in. Um, so we know they're in garden soil. So if we put a spadeful in or more as you're going along and building up your um, compost bin, um, we are adding the bacteria, sometimes worms, sometimes beetles, and these are the creatures that are going to digest the ingredients that you've put in and the kitchen waste. Now, you know, sometimes you may have seen in garden centers sort of accelerator, compost maker. You don't really need to buy anything to add and make sure that this works. But you can add nettles or comfrey, and I'll talk about them later as well, because they work very well helping the breakdown. But basically, soil is useful. Um, so what do we need to give these microorganisms apart from <clears throat> the ingredients that I've talked about? They need moisture to function because they're living creatures. So there should be enough in the fresh ingredients that you've added. Um, but if it's too dry, then rainwater can be added to help with the moisture that's there. Um, they need air. So our carbon brown products will help make sort of air pockets in amongst the green waste. <clears throat> but also what we do, you may have heard of this turning. In other words, we turn all the ingredients in the compost bin or the compost heap and therefore allowing air to get into the system. Sometimes you get squashed vegetables and garden waste and it seems quite wet and stuck together. So by turning it with a fork, a garden fork, um, that adds air to the bin. Um, now, if you've got a plastic garden bin, um, compost bin, it can be quite difficult sometimes if it's full to get the fork into it. And what you could do, and I know it seems a bit of a large job to do, you can put a tarpaulin in front of where the bin is, pull off the plastic surround, let all the material fall onto the tarpaulin and then put it back in. And by doing that, that will add air as well. So there are various ways you can think of to try and get air into your compost bin. The other thing is if you get screwed up brown paper and you literally screw it up into lump bunches then there's air in that so that helps produce air in the in the whole system um, so we've got moisture we've got air and we need heat or warmth to speed up the process because the organisms work in a nice warm environment um, and the higher the temperature the quicker you're going to get compost so in a commercial or a council um, compost composting area the peak temperature is 60 degrees which is incredibly high and you won't ever get that high but um, you can make it as warm as possible by making sure that all these things are working that the compost is sited in a nice sheltered place um, you can take the lid off sometimes as well because you should have a lid on it. Um, so warmth is necessary. So let's just go through the composting process. You've got all your ingredients in there. You've got air, moisture, warmth. So how much do you need to put in of each ingredient? Um, <clears throat> surprisingly, the green raw materials are only 25 or 50% of what goes in. So it just shows you how important it is to have the brown dry material. Um, so 25 to 50% green materials and the rest should be that drown, dry material. Um, <clears throat> you can cover the bin to keep it warm as well. And the process isn't quick, but it's worth it. So it can take between three months or, or almost a year so to speed things up, if you chop up anything that's tough, like lemon peel, orange peel, banana skins, shrub prunings that you've taken, if you chop it up as small as you can um, and tear up your cardboard, 
into small bits. So that's something you can get if you're in groups to get people to do, they can be making things as small as possible. That will help the process of breaking it down as quickly as possible and therefore accelerate the process. So how do you add all these things? Well, if you're starting from the beginning or at any point, <clears throat> this is what you have to do. So to start at the very beginning, at the very bottom of your compost heap or bin, <clears throat> put in a layer of sticks or twigs. And therefore, if there's too much moisture, the moisture will run through those and stop taking all the ingredients with it. So that's a great thing. It also allows air and space. So any collection of sticks or twigs, you don't have to break them up because you actually want them to form a layer at the bottom. And then what you do is you add the materials we've been talking about, the green and brown materials in layers as you go along. So each layer should be between two to four inches or five to 10 centimeters. So not too thick. So if you've done a lot of um, uh, mowing of grass, it shouldn't, um, be you don't put it all in at once because you'll end up with sort of sludgy smelly broken down grass so you need to put it in bit by bit and you don't have to fill the whole bin up all at once you just do it gradually as you get more and more material so you'll collect material from the kitchen until you've got say a small bin full and then you'll take it out put a layer in and then put a layer of of um, the brown material and as i said if you're Unsure whether it's working or it seems a bit smelly, put in a spade full of garden comp soil and that you can cover the surface with a layer of that. And as I said, that lad, the microorganisms. OK, so layer upon layer, gradually as you can. So what problems do we have? Because sometimes people do have problems and it doesn't work quite well. It can be too wet. It can be slimy and smelly and you get little tiny flies on it. Um, so not enough air, basically. And I, I was talking about the um, mown grass, too much, say, compacted grass or, or green materials. So you can add more brown, drier materials to it. You can turn it more often with your fork to get air in. You can take, if it's got a top, if it's a plastic one, take the top off, let some air in in that way. Um, or alternatively, maybe it's getting too much rain, so you need to put the top on, okay? Um, and as I said, you can deter the flies by adding another layer of garden soil. So garden soil is very good for sort of balancing the whole thing out. So that's if it's too wet. On the other hand, sometimes they get too dry, especially in the summertime, um, and things aren't breaking down because they're just sitting there dry. So you need to add some moisture to it. So maybe you've got too much brown material, or maybe it just hasn't got enough moisture. So you can add more green waste, obviously, and as I said, especially nettles and comfrey. Um, and you can moisten it. And if you can get rainwater, if you collect rainwater, that's better than the water that's come through our taps that may have chlorine in or may have other minerals in them. So if you can get rainwater and just gradually add water until you feel that the whole thing is moist, not soaking wet, but moist. And then the system will work again. So it doesn't, it stops if it's dry, but it will work again as soon as it gets moist again. So you've done all that, you've worked it out, you've waited, you've turned it. So what happens? You will know when your compost is ready because it won't smell, it'll smell nice. It'll smell pleasant the what's in it is dark brown and crumbly um it'll have a I say, we say sweets but a kind of woodland smell you know that nice smell of breaking down leaves and so on <clears throat> so that's when it is ready and also you should be able to see that most of the things you put in you can't see what they are anymore they've broken down so much that they've just become compost um, so if you've still got, if you still see, and as you search about in it, some maybe often twigs or stems or things that aren't breaking down properly yet, you can take them out and use what has broken down and add to the other, add the bits that haven't rotted down yet to a new batch because they eventually will break down. Some things just take longer. Um, 
how what can you use your compost for? Well, you can use it directly on any soil, anything you're growing directly in, in the garden you've got or the space you've got. So you can add it to it, you can dig it round to improve the soil, or you can add it to the surface surface of it to act as a mulch, which stops weeds coming up and feeds the soil. Um, if you want to pot on smaller plants <clears throat> and you, everything you've got is in pots, you can use it for that. Now, again, if it's, you've got some big lumps, um, just sieve the compost if you can, or take some of the lumps out and use that. <clears throat> well, what I will say here is it's not the greatest thing for seeds. Well, seed growing needs very um, pure, quite specific compost for you not to get rotting off. Doesn't mean you can't, but you may find it doesn't work as well. Um, and in which case you buy a seed sowing compost, which you know is pure, has nothing in it that will be a problem and is a certain texture. So you can try growing seeds, but it, you may have some problems, okay? And the other thing is, when your compost looks beautiful and you're using it, um, it's great, it's quite bulky, it can really improve the garden soil or anything you've got, but you ne never know how much food or nutrients it has in it because you're not measuring it. Unlike multi-purpose compost that you buy where on the side of the pack it says exactly how much nitrogen for green growth, how much phosphorus, how much potassium. Um, so, if you're using um, your own compost, garden compost for plotting up plants, it's a good idea to add some chicken pellets or to add some fertilizer just to add a bit more nutrients to it. Um, and or you can feed the plants with liquid feed, which is where I'm going to go now. So liquid fertilizer. So this is not the bulky material that we're making in our compost but this is adding nutrients or food, if you like, to any plants that we're growing. So you may have seen um, homemade liquid fertilizer, sometimes called tea, nettle tea or comfrey tea, um, but it can be made from plants that you have in your garden and you, it's free, of course, like all these things, um, and it will help the growth of the plants, especially plants that need quite a lot of food. So if you've ever grown tomatoes, they need feeding quite a lot. And flowering bedding plants need feeding. So um, any liquid fertilizer you make is diluted with water, watered onto the compost around the plants. So not to around the leaves. Um, and this adds nutrients. So as I said, it adds for nitrogen, phosphates and potassium, which help flowering and fruiting. So how do we do it? Well, we can use comfrey plants, which, um, which we can grow in our plot. Um, comfrey is a perennial plant, which you can grow from seed, or you can buy a small plant and it will grow quite big. So you're gonna have quite a lot of material to use for making liquid feed. Um, it's actually, there's a picture of it here. It's actually quite an attractive plant. So it's a nice addition to the garden but it has very big leaves and the leaves are what we're going to use um, to make our liquid feed. And comfrey is particularly good for producing nutrients, food that are good for root and stem growth and for flowering and fruit. So any crops, any summer flowering bedding plants, great. And the next one that we might use are nettles, which is quite surprising. Um, and nettles are great for having a uh, very nitrogen rich, so they're good for green growth. So if you've got a patch or you're able to access a patch on someone else's plot, but please ask. So where you've been allowed, you may be near a farm where they don't mind if you take some of the nettles, but you should be leaving some wherever it is to, because they're great source of food and a place that butterflies lay their eggs. So it's very important that we do allow nettles to grow some places, but we can also use them as well. So their nettles, on the other hand, are very high in nitrogen. 
which is good for green leafy growth. So both plants are very useful for making it. How do we make it then? So what do we need? Well, we need gloves, stout gloves, so that we can pull up our nettles <coughs> or to take the leaves of the comfrey off, which are quite um, hairy, so it can be quite uncomfortable. So make sure that whoever does it has good, thick gloves, not thin ones. <coughs> we need comfrey leaves and with nettle, you need the leaves and the stem because it can all be used. Um, we're not going to mix them up. We're going to do them separately so we know which feed we have and we can label our bottles and say that's good for leaves, that's good for flowers. Um, you'll need a large bucket with a lid or a cover. Um, one of the uh, articles I was reading about, it said a black bucket is good because it absorbs sunlight and keeps it warm, which you need. So a bucket with a lid or a cover. Um, a stone, a brick, something heavy, which holds the leaves down. You also need some plastic bottles, which are going to pour the liquid that we make into. So recycled milk or juice bottles, big bottles, and of course a watering can to water it on. So wearing the gloves, you're gonna collect the comfrey leaves. You just pull off the leaves, put them in your container, or the nettle and the stems. But Again, to make it break down quickly, if you chop or with scissors or secateurs or tear the leaves and damage the nettle stems, break them up, as you put them in, um, it's going to break down much quicker. So you're gonna pack that container that you've got tightly with as many of either thing and then weigh it down with a heavy stone or a brick. <clears throat> so that they're all together and pushed right down hard. Um, now, some people would add water, but this is a recipe without using water, which is actually better. So don't add anything. All you need are the leaves or the plants, and you cover it up with a lid or a waterproof covering if you haven't got a lid for your container, something like a bit of tarpaulin, a bit of plastic, and seal it if you can. Um, and you're gonna put that bucket into somewhere like the sunniest, hottest place, on your um, site. And that you need to leave in this hot space, hoping you've got lots of sun, because of course this is going to be made in the summer or the growing season. Um, you can leave it for three or four weeks. And what you will find if you take the lid off is that the, and you'll see a picture of what you will find, which is the leaves have now turned brown and all the soft material has broken down into a liquid which will be dark brown or greeny color, but also very smelly. You have to be prepared for this, it's very smelly, but it's good. So you've now got, after a month or so, this lovely liquid, and you're going to collect that liquid into your recycled bottles. And when, so they're ready for use whenever you want to use them and store them somewhere dark and cool a shed somewhere like that so they're out of the way. Um, so once you've poured off the liquid, you're gonna end up with old plant material, but you can put that on the compost heap because that will break down nicely in the compost. Um, so how do you use it? You dilute it one part liquid, comfrey liquid or nettle liquid to 10 parts water um, into your, um, container and water your plants either on the wherever they are in a pot or a tub um, water on the soil on the compost don't go onto the foliage because it can scorch the foliage and that should really help your plants grow and it means you don't have to buy fertilizer which is the main thing so there we are so now I'm just interested in if you have any questions or otherwise we can talk about anything to do with any of this composting or the fertilizer. Thanks, Caroline. I do actually have a couple of questions in the chat here. Um, a couple from Margaret. So the first one yeah. is, um, can you put an old cotton and will includes um, into the compost heap and maybe cut them into small pieces? Yes, yes. 
because again, they're naturally occurring fabrics. Just make sure they're not mixed up with polyester or anything that won't break down, but you can, absolutely. You can also put stuff from inside your hoover. Um, waste from there. There's all sorts of waste as well as the things I was talking about, but yes, absolutely. If you've got old naturally occurring materials, chop them up and put them in, fantastic. Thank you. Great. And Margaret's also asking, um, does leaf mould break down differently from compost? Okay. Um, some of you may have heard of leaf mould, and this is when you collect lots and lots of leaves in the autumn and you want to break them down to make uh, some sort of composting material. Um, you often get far too much for putting in the compost bin. So what we suggest is you have them separately and let them break down separately, and they may take a year to break down. You could add small amounts to your compost bin, but if you've got lots and lots and lots of leaves, you can make leaf mold, which is a fantastic material for mulching and improving soil. So there's different ways of doing it, depending on the space you've got. You can either get some black plastic bags, make some holes in them and just fill, stuff the uh, leaves in as much as you can, as tightly as you can into these black plastic bags, tie them off, put them somewhere shady in a corner of the garden. You're not gonna have to look at them, pile them up and literally they will break down and you should be able to use them within a year or a year from when you had them. Um, if you've got lots of room, you can make a similar to the um, <coughs> compost bins, the wooden ones uh, I was talking about before. You just get four um, posts and you can put chicken wire and you can put them in to that, just put them in. So they don't need as much of the different sorts of materials we were talking about with composting. They can just be leaves, that's all. And that again will break down, but it will take probably a year. So if you've got lots of space, fantastic. Great, great um, thing to use. Great. Um, and Margaret's also commented saying that she's always added water to the nettles or comfrey. It's good to know that you can make it without water. So thank you. That's a pleasure. Yes, I, I have always heard in the past that you add water, but then you get lots and lots of this very strong smelling material that you kind of have to use quickly. So getting a stronger material by doing it without water is a great sort of concentrated fertilizer. So that's uh, fantastic, and I will be doing it too. Just buy your comfrey plant or grow it from seed. Great. Does anybody else have any more questions? Pop them in the chat or just unmute and voice them. Has anyone been composting and got some great tips for us? or things that they have thought about when they've been doing it. That's always useful. Um, just wanted to, I know at the local place they have for the comfrey, um, it's like an old drain pipe. Okay. And there's something in it. I don't, I, I just didn't know what it was, but I've seen um, one of the gardeners use it as, you know, a big tube and then there's a stone in it and then the water comes out the bottom. So that's the only way I sort of, and that's why I was quite interested to find out about how to make the comfrey mm -hmm. fertilizer. So it, this seems a bit more, your version's a lot simpler, which is good for me. Yeah, I think the simpler of any of these things, the better, because we're much more likely to do them when they're simpler. Yeah. Um, and of course, you know, the containers, it could be an old big paint, you know, you can get plastic paint containers, you know, once those are cleared out, they've got a good lid you can put on as well. So it can be as small or as big as you want that container, depending on how much liquid you're trying to produce. Um, but comfrey is a wonderful plant. It's so vigorous. It's so easy to grow. It's never a problem. You've just got to get one, pop it in. And even if you've stripped off a lot of the leaves, leave some, so it keeps, it'll keep growing so you can make more later. So it's a brilliant way of doing it. And of course, nettles are great, depending on whether you've got a, a source of them that you can get 
um, easily. So I'm just looking at, there was another message came up, which is kind of... Yeah. So Finney's asking, is it okay to put compostable food containers, magazine bags, etc., into com the compost heap? You've got to, it's a bit difficult because you've got to find out when they say compostable, are they breaking down into small bits of um, polythene or is it actually made of a um, plant-based material? It's really confusing these days. Um, so if you can track and see what the bag container, whatever is made of, that's the main thing. As long as it's made of something which is plant-based, absolutely. But with everything, tear it up, make it as small as possible. When they say it's compostable, often it, you know, it's too bulky, it takes a while. So just be careful of what, what it's really made of. Okay. And Marie Laura is saying that um, I use three compost bins, so always have ready to use compost underhand. Absolutely. So that's a very important too. If you have enough space, you can have more than one compost bin so that you can be adding to one. And when that's full, that can be breaking down and you leave it. And then you've got another one you could be adding to and so on. So there's always a compost bin that's ready to take all the fresh material and one that's already broken down. And maybe if you're lucky, you've got space for three, one that's in the process of breaking down. So it's absolutely fantastic if you can do that. That's the best way of doing it. Unfortunately, we don't all have enough space. So you have to just do it as you can, you know. Okay, and Margaret is also saying that the bees love the comfrey flowers as well. Right. And she says, I empty the tea bags as the materials, um, the tea leaves are, and has plastic in it. Um, so she just tears open the tea bags. You can check. Yeah, she's quite right. Tea bags, some tea bags are sealed together with a small amount of plastic. So you don't want to put those in, in which case you're right. You tear them open, let just the tea fall into your bin instead. But some companies now do produce tea bags which don't have plastic in. So you can check those. I'm trying to think of the name of the company that doesn't, but basically any organic tea probably won't, but you can double check. And I'm sure online you can search for the companies who are making tea bags without making sort of artificial um, glues as well. The other thing you can use, of course, is um, your coffee grains. So coffee grains can go into your compost bin too. Uh, they're slightly acidic, but that's okay. As long as you're not, you'd have to be drinking an awful lot of coffee to really change um, the process, but it's absolutely fine to put coffee grains as well. I'm sure you're gonna come up with lots of things to think of that are kind of naturally produced things that you can put in, but that's great. And there's so much information online these days about these things. So if you go to a, a reputable um, online information like the Royal Horticultural Society or Gardener's World or one of those, you know that they, you're getting the right information. Great. Um, Sally's saying that some coffee shops give away coffee grains for free. Absolutely. So ask around. And the same for cardboard. If you have, if you don't get loads of things sent to you and you need cardboard, lots of the shops will be happy, I'm sure, to give you boxes or whatever that you can use. Great. Any final uh, questions or comments before we finish up? We've just got people coming in saying thank you. Super helpful. Yeah, good. Very informative. Good, good luck with it all. It's a great way of making compost. 